episode of Your Business Unleashed podcast. I am super honored and uh, and feel privileged and thrilled to have uh, one of, I would say, my mentors on, uh, Chuck Blakeman. Chuck, thank you so much for being with us. By way of a quick intro, Chuck's got three best-selling business books, um, including Why Employees Are Always a Bad Idea, Making Money is Killing Your, Your Business, and Rehumanizing the Workforce by Giving Everybody Their Brains Back. And these three business books for me have been really foundational in the last five years and how I've built out our accounting firm and our business advisory practice. So, and I know that you're a serial entrepreneur, Chuck, and that's all I'll say for a minute and let you take over on uh, on sort of who you are. And thank you so much for joining. Oh, it's it's great to be with you. And yes, that's my background. I've, I've built uh, you know, 13 businesses, I think in 10 industries on four continents, and I'm just getting started. Got another 50 years left to plan to live till I'm 120 at least. So, so we got a lot of time left to do fun stuff and my poor wife and all that, you know, she's, she's had to put up with all this craziness, but at the same time, we all are benefiting from it. So yeah, life is a, life is an adventure and off we go. Let's do it again. Yeah. Yeah. Right on. I, um, I, I think one of the main reasons why, you know, I've read a lot of business books, um, quite a lot, a lot of them suggested by people on, you know, that, that you work with actually. And uh, one of the reasons that your books sort of resonate with me as a whole is I would say your message uh, for me really speaks to the human aspect of being an entrepreneur and, and, uh, and, and it's sort of an antithesis to hustle culture. Right. And, and uh, I really appreciate that because I believe in a lot of the same things, you know, is that, is that sort of where you, uh, where did great, that come from? Great take, yeah, it's a great take on that. And, and I, I don't know where it comes from other than for some reason early on in my life, I, I became suspicious of the world around me, not the world, but the messages that a lot of the world was giving me. I became suspicious early on that this wasn't maybe the whole truth and in many cases wasn't the truth. And, and so I've been, uh, I've been accused of being a, a counterculturalist or, or just against stuff, and I'm really not. I'm really for doing the right things and and we find that a lot of things that we're taught in business are just dumb. They have yeah. no foundation in in productivity or or in humanity or anything else. And one of them is the rugged individualist, the great American disease. Uh, I am a recovering John Wayne rugged individualist. You know, I, I had that disease in spades, and it's really a bad idea. It was never a good idea, and it's a worse idea today than it's ever been. And one of the one of the uh, aspects of that that you just touched on is that we somehow think that being an entrepreneur or being a business owner, I, I see those as two different things. But uh, that that thing that that's a thing. It's a it's a it's a human doing rather than a human being. We talk in terms of productivity when we want to talk about building a business. It's exactly that we talk about building the business. And my experience in building many businesses is that really what we need to do is build the human being in, in behind that business because that's the only way the business gets to be what it is. I am capped by my own potential, my own limitations, my own what they, the fancy people call limiting beliefs, all that fun stuff. And uh, when you after 125 plus years of research on how to be more productive and how to be better human doings, even those, even those that go in trying to measure that, they come out with, if you're, if you're kind to people and you treat them like adults, you make more money. Yeah. That's basically what the research has shown us. For and it's not even close. Like it's not even, it's not like a, uh, maybe it's this or maybe it's that. It's, it's not even close, right? No, no, it's yeah. not. It's not even close. There's, uh, there's all kinds of uh, data points and data research on this that you, you can basically see a 100%, a 10 times gain in your business by spending, by investing your energies on making the environment better for the people than you will by trying to figure out how to make your assembly lines go faster. Okay. So, I mean, that's a long history and, and I don't, we could sit here for hours and go through your whole book because you've written at length about this. And I, and I really appreciate the messages of, you know, where we were all entrepreneurs before and we went through this industrial revolution and, and there were sort of, there's a renaissance on the way here of, 
of just getting human with each other again and figuring out what we want out of business and how COVID sort of reset that. I mean, for me, I was in the hustle culture. I I wanted I was in sales and it was high pressure sales and I grew an awesome sales team and I got flown to Toronto and went on boats for awards and all the things. And uh, and then I took a huge pay cut and got into accounting, but that was another hustle culture. And by the end of my training there, I was working, you know, just crazy. You know, I think there was one project where I slept under the desk for a couple of days and, uh, and I started my own business so that I didn't have to do that anymore. But then I found myself in the exact same trap of my daughter was born. Government's changed some regulations. I got a lot of phone calls to make. I'm going to miss my dinner table tonight and something had to give. And I think that's when, when we reached out to your to your firm, uh, Crankset Group, to say, "Hey, I need a change here, right?" And so that's sort of sort of my journey to you, and Crankset Group. Where does yours start? Like, where yeah. where did you know where did you go? I'm gonna I'm gonna jump off the bridge here and and try being an entrepreneur because being an employee just isn't good enough for me. Well, I I I was pretty close to unemployable right up front. Uh, I graduated at the bottom of my class in high school. They had me in the principal's office deciding whether they'd let me out. That's how bad it was. They didn't know what ADHD and dyslexia were back then. They just thought I was stupid. Uh, and so and so did I. So, you know, that I'm unemployable right from the get-go. So I went, I went to music school. I got a full scholarship to a classical music school at Cleveland Institute of Music and ended up doing that and went into the Army because the Army is the only people who could possibly... Uh, you know, that's the only job I could ever get. They have to take me. I, I did have a high school diploma. And I went, in, went into the Army Band, which was military welfare. We could talk about that at another time. But uh, <laughs> while I was in the Army Band, I sort of, uh, I'm not sure by mistake or just unintentionally started some little business thing and thought, well, that's interesting. Maybe I do have something to offer the world around me. And Started another one and fast forward again, 13 businesses in 10 industries on four continents later. Uh, apparently ADHD and dyslexia are good things to have. It turns out like something 80 plus percent of entrepreneurs are, are ADHD. So there's something good in there. So my journey actually to the idea of, of getting off this treadmill, because most of the first five or six businesses were what you call the hustle culture. It was just work harder my intention was if I work harder, I'll make more money. So the, the intention was I want to work hard, make money. And my one, or, and my one hope was I hope it all works out. And the problem with that is I got exactly what I intended. I got hard work and I got some money and it didn't work out because I was just hoping it would work out. So yeah. after my fifth business, I watched my fifth business go from, from two of us to 109 people. And I was still working 50 hours a week plus. And I thought, how did I do this to myself? Seems like if, you know, we got all these other people, how is it that I ended up working you know, as much or more than I did when we began? So in my sixth business, I said, I don't know how I'm going to do this. And it sounds like a dumb idea, but I'm going to figure out how this business will serve me instead of me serving this business. I'm not going to be a hostage to this business. I'm going to own it. It's not going to own me. And so I'm going to do this. I'm going to figure out how to make, more money in less time. Now, I had no clue how to do that uh, at all, Clayton, when I said that. I just knew that that's what I wanted. And this becomes an intention. And you get what you intend, not what you hope for. Yeah. And I intended to figure out before I just hoped that would I wouldn't it be nice if every business we built, with the more we, we built, yeah. the, the, the more money we make with, with the less time in it. Well, yeah. It doesn't work that way. So I had to intend it. And that's where my journey began was really in, about 2005, 2006, I said, I, I got to do this differently this time. I don't know how, but off we go. You were relatively late to the game. I didn't realize that. I yeah, didn't realize no, I, that. I'm a learner. There's yeah. a reason I built 13 businesses. <laughs> <That's hard. laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and, and it's interesting. I, I don't know what your journey of discovery was to get to, because when did you release uh, Making Money is Killing Your Business? It was actually about four years later, I wrote down, my experience of having figured out for the first time how to make more money in less time. And that became making money is killing your business. That became that book. So it was really a, just a, 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 a compendium or a biography, if you would, of my own journey from being in that hustle culture to figuring out how to build a business that makes more money in less time. And yeah. so I, was, I was working 60 hours a week 
making uh, about the same money that four years later I was working uh, 15 hours, 14 hours a week. Yeah. Same yeah. thing three years later. So that's that's where that came in in 2010 is when that book was published. And it became right. the one business book of 2010. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's still, still, I'd say still my number one business book. And I, uh, I'm so grateful that someone went through and actually thought through it and wrote the things down. You know, we can all think through how to solve our problems, but actually writing them down and setting an intention to distribute that. I mean, that's a hell of a thing. Well, I think and, that was uh, why, it, why, it, uh, why it is still a very popular book. It has a lot of legs because it's not a book I wrote. It's a life I lived. And I just happened to write it down as I did it. Yeah. And people yeah. like real life, you know, I want to know what really happened, not something in some ivory tower, I can make up any kind of, you know, anything to put out in a book that sounds good. But no, this is stuff we bled over, it works. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and, and you know, what a what a story. And, and I would say, you know, as one of the pieces of entre to the entrepreneurs that I speak with, and uh, certainly the listeners of, of this episode, and, and many others, is you don't have to go through the same pain that you did. I certainly went through it for a while until I found some resources to go. You know, you can accelerate your growth path if you just read read from the people who have come before you, right? This is not, these aren't new ideas. You know, none of the, no. as you even say in the book, these aren't new ideas, um, no. right? You know? It's, it's one of the four building blocks. We call it outside eyes. As yeah. a rugged individualist, I had the, the pride of being able to print a business card and pretend that I knew what I was doing and let everybody know that. <laughs> and, and, you know, and, and yet, you know, I'd be, I'd be telling me, you know, they'd ask me how business is, and I'd say, well, business is great. And inside, I'm saying, I'm dying inside, and you know, I'm not sleeping, and yeah. I'm sweating bullets, and but I can't tell anybody that. I have to let them know, think that I know what's going on. And yeah, so marriage is on the rocks. Mortgage payments are yeah, coming due. Absolutely. You know, all the things. Yeah. And so, what if you had outside eyes on all this to accelerate your learning? What if you were humble enough to actually do that? It took me a while to get broken to get outside eyes and, and have people who have no dog in the hunt have a very objective view of my business and say, hey, why don't you try this? Yeah, yeah. And you did that. And I did that. And yeah. it worked. Yeah. Where'd you go for those people? What was your, you know, pre three to five club? Where where did you land on the on the yeah, outside I, eyes? Well, I was fortunate enough to have some friends that I saw, I, I saw what I liked in their businesses. And I went to them and say, hey, what are you doing? Yeah. So I took a learner's mindset from that and, and tried to be teachable on stuff that, that I otherwise would have said, hey, I already have this figured out. And, and so that, that was a big chunk of it. And then the other chunk of it was me having this real clarity of vision that I was going to somehow build something that made more money in less time. Yeah. I, yeah. None, none of the guys I talked to actually had done that. One of them had sort of done it without knowing it. So I had to learn that piece on my own, but but there were so many things I could pick up from the way they viewed business that could help me get there so much faster if I just got involved in community. Yeah, yeah. So for for those of you who are who are doing a bender on my podcast series here, um, I, I recorded. I was on yesterday. You won't. It won't be released in this order, of course. But I was on yesterday recording a podcast with a with a a payment fintech uh, Calgary company, and they do they're, they're a fintech company, and they do they do payments, and then they do good at it, and they're great. And uh, the, the the fellow's name is Nick Beak, and one of the things that he said, uh, you know, I asked him for what what are the what would you tell people, and he said, you know, ask ask somebody who's been through it before right? Yeah. Ask somebody who's been through it before. And so for those of you who are doing a bender on my podcast, I think Chuck is the third or fourth founder to say the exact same thing. So outside eyes, right? Get some mentorship, get some help, right? And that's helped all everybody, all the most successful people that I've had on this podcast and successes. We can talk about how you measure success a bit later, but they're all saying the same thing. There's people who've been through this and they're happy to share their experiences with you. And, and it's a principle. It's a life principle. I was I was a, probably an 18 to 20 handicap in golf for 35 years, and then I decided I wanted to be a scratch golfer, and uh, I went and found a coach for the first time in my life. Mm. And he said and he laughed at my swing, and I said, "Why are you laughing?" I says, "Well, you want to be a scratch golfer?" And he said, "Yes." He said, "Not with that swing. <laughs> you have to start over, and you're not going to be able to play golf. This is April. You will not be able to play golf this year. You'll, be, you'll start playing golf sometime in October, maybe." 
Wow. Even here at golf course, if you really want to, and I, in two and a, a little over two and a half, three years, I got down to a 1.9. I decided I didn't wow. want to go farther. But the point of that rant is the same thing happens in business. When you get outside eyes, you can be in a place for 30 plus years thinking you're doing just fine. Somebody else takes a look at your business swing and says, you know, if you want to get better, here's here's something you might want to try. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of your a lot of your um, uh, entrepreneurial experience comes from comes from some experiences that you have in Africa that you wrote about. Right. And how you you went and saw sort of. You, 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 it sounded like you had some very humbling experiences over there. And and yeah, uh, yeah. Why, why don't you talk about that for a minute? Because I love those stories. Yeah, it's the only place I've ever lost money in a business. And this is something you've probably heard consistently from other people. But I call it measured risk. Normally, I take measured risks. This was a an unmeasured risk or a big risk. It was measured, but it was still a bigger risk. My risks have always been, let me, let me make shoes and sell some shoes. And if I can sell six or eight or 10 pairs, then let me throw some money at this and just make it bigger and make mm. it run faster. This was, uh, we hadn't sold anything. And let's go over there and spend an awful lot of money on this idea of solving poverty through developing small businesses. This is a very noble idea. Mm -hmm. And many, 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 many hundreds of thousands of dollars later, we <laughs> ran into the president of a company who uh, basically made us persona non grata and uh, and stopped the whole thing in its tracks. Uh, and in, that kind of, in the process of that, I learned a lot of things, but I, I learned a lot about the universality of the principles of business and how people in Africa were hurting for the same things that we were needing here. Mm -hmm. So there, there was a lot of things I learned over there that transferred back. Like over. what? That's what are the same things? I was over there re working with people who were so poor that that when I decided not to use my handouts because they were worthless, they grabbed them because the backs were empty. The backs were some paper. Yeah. And they had blank paper on the backs that they could put in their, with their kids at school. And yes, so they were in poverty. And I was, I was talking to people in a building with blown out with no windows and no doors and the sand floor and, and little benches. And that was their, their church. Um, and a lot of other things It functioned a lot of ways. So it was just a very poor environment. And on the plane back, I, I, was, th I was thinking about the experience of what did I learn in that particular, uh, that particular time in, in Africa. And I realized that everyone has a mindset of poverty. The mindset of poverty is universal. And what I mean by that is you, if I lined 100 people from that that slum we call you know what we call slums in in that part of Africa, we lined 100, 100 people there, 100 business owners up against a wall. From that slum, their net worth would be somewhere near nothing. Yeah, yeah. If you lined up 100 people from my hometown here in Highlands Ranch, Colorado, up business owners up against another wall, their net worth would be minus tens, if not hundreds, of millions. Minus. Minus. Yeah. They're all leveraged. Yeah. yeah. And I'm thinking, what's going on here? Well, yeah. the mindset of poverty involved in, in, in this whole thing that we don't really understand what it means to live at net zero and to get to net zero. What would it be like? These people are happy in Africa. Yeah. And yeah. these 100, 100 yeah. people, imaginary people in Ohio, they're miserable. They're yeah. panicked. They're leverage to the hill. And if you ever made, this is the mindset of poverty piece. If you ever manage to get to zero. So let's say you're covering your mortgage, you're covering your payments, you're paying for your kids. And now you have some extra, you get an extra $5,000 coming in every month. What do you do? You go buy a bigger house and put yourself mm -hmm. in debt again, mm -hmm. or yeah. you get an extra 50,000 a month where you go buy yourself a helicopter. You yeah. get yourself we somehow just can't understand that there's a place at which enough would be enough. Enough would be enough. Yeah, that's not. And, and that, that is, is, this is one of your counterculture things, Chuck, right? We're not supposed to do that. Indefinite growth, right? So Right. Grow or yeah. die. Who made that rule? Well, yeah. I'll tell you, it wasn't a small business owner. It's an investor who made that rule. Yeah. But it, it goes back to one of the other four building blocks, which is uh, the idea, the need for us to all have lifetime goals or what we call a big why. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I, I was going to ask you about big why, because these people in Africa who were happy, yeah. there's a reason that they're happy. 
they, yeah. you know, and, and I think it's, you know, I think it relates to what you're about to say, but that's what I, that's what I associate it with. You know, when, when I look at our, our, our cultural, I think there's just like this enormous discontent happening over here sure. that we have, you know, and, and the more you have, and I can't remember it was you or a study you referred to, or someone else who said, you know, the, the happiness, ma- the happiness money equation sort of levels out when you're able to fend off your creditors, right? Yeah. That's, that's well, your net zero, right? Yeah, so. it's, it used to be 20 years ago, 75,000. Now it's like 125 to $150,000. There is actually some measurable uh, relationship between some money and getting to about 100 to 125,000. After that, it falls off to nothing. Yeah. I mean, on the happiness a, scale. Yeah. Yeah. If you can take two weeks vacation and maybe buy a hot tub, after that, there is no amount of money that will make you any happier. This is verified, researched, you know, neuroscience data. You're not going to get anything more out of it. But somehow we need it. And the reason why we need it is because we don't have a big why. Or or that is our big why, right? Well, it's it's a big why substitute because it is, yeah. Because my definition of a big why is something you can never check off as complete. So I had a guy call me from California one day after reading my book. Didn't know him, now he's a friend. And he said, hey, I'm making $1.2 million take home every year as a coach. I build a business to 40 million. I build another one to 100 million. Now I'm helping other people do it. And I'm training for uh, uh, marathons and and uh, the, the triathlons. And he's got all these crazy, you know, what someone would call big, hairy, audacious goals. And I said, what are you doing all this for? Yeah. Why are you doing this? And he'd give me, well, you know, because you want to grow to 100 million. Yeah, but why? Well, you know, because I want to be able to run faster. Why? And it pretty quickly got to crickets. He had no reason why. And I said, would you mind if I'm obnoxious and tell you what I think? Why you're doing this stuff? Why you're growing businesses to 40 million, 100 million? Why you're doing this manic, crazy coaching? I think it's because you don't know why you're alive. Hmm. And he's your friend still. You, and he's yeah, and he's still my friend because yeah. he had the courage, he has enough courage to build forty to hundred million dollar business. He's a courageous guy, but that's basically you know we fill the big Y shaped vacuum in our lives with nonsense, and we trade in fulfillment for achievement. So achieving all these things, but see when you achieve a twenty million or forty million dollar business, you can check it off as complete. When you run your triathlon at the hourly whatever it was you wanted, 13 and a half, you can check that off. Three hour marathon, you can check that off. And it's never satisfying because you're chasing ghosts. You're chasing myths. Yeah. Uh, a goal realized is not no longer motivating. So yeah. we have to find another goal. What yeah. if you had a goal in life that you could never fulfill? And yet every day you could fulfill it. And the next day it comes back again. So you can you can finish it every day and, and the next day it's never complete. What if you had something that you would just never be able to finish the rest of your life? Like being a great mom. Yeah, yeah. Or solving world hunger. Yeah. You know, it doesn't have to be something yeah. giant. I want my kids to always want to come home. That's one of mine, you know? Yeah, and yeah. What, if you, what if you made that a thing? My mom died when she was 92, 93 years old and she was still trying to be a good mom. You know, you're yeah. never done with those things. So- what is it? What's the transformational things you can do in the world around you that would motivate you to get out of bed the rest of your life and use your business to help you do that? So that's yeah. where that's where enough becomes enough. One guy decided that one of his big why was to just see the world uh, and never finish seeing the world and play a lot of rugby. Nice. So he he developed a rugby tourism business. Okay. And he put up this website and he'd collect people. And once he got like 20, uh, 20 guys and their spouses, he'd put together a three-week tour of you know South Africa or wow. England. Yeah. They'd have a rugby game every three or four days once to, so they could heal in between and do tourism. And he sold his big house and moved into an apartment because he didn't need a big house anymore. He was gone three weeks of every month and he didn't need all that. His big why reduced his need for money. Now. I want to solve world hunger or, or poverty. I want to solve poverty. So I have enough time and energy, but I'll never have enough money, I don't think. Or, and if I do, you know, well, actually, that's not fair. I, I could get to it, 
we're going to need about $750 million to solve poverty uh, worldwide. But, you know, that's a pretty big goal. So that's going to take me more time and energy. So the point of that is we were taught that time, money, and energy were the goal. Let me be physically fit. Let me get a buttload of money in the, in the bank and let me get some freedom. Yeah. The reason most people don't get at least two out of three and many times three out of three of those is because they don't have any reason to have those resources. Yeah. They're just resources. Yeah. And it's, it sounds motivating to tell someone how do you, let's make more money in less time. That's I'm in. That sounds yeah, yeah. Everybody would say yes to that. I think. Yeah. But most people will never get it because they don't have a big, why they don't have a reason to have those three resources. If you have, if you know that it's going to take you this amount of time and this amount of money and this amount of energy to live out your big why, now you got a real motivation to grow your business to the point where it gives you that amount of time, money, and energy. So what about you? What's your big why? So my big why is to live well by doing good. And a big why generally, will you'll find will we'll have characteristics like that where it's kind of, kind of fuzzy. Yeah. It's value laden. It's always value laden. It has value words, but it's big enough. It has a big enough umbrella that you could just about do that with every breath. Yeah, I could yeah. be a I could be a truck driver and I could live well by doing good. I could be a school teacher. I could be a dad. I could be walking down the street and help someone across the street and live well by doing good. So your your big whys are generally not real measurable they give birth to tons of measurable things. So I have, you know, X amount of business owners that I want to, to impact each year. And I want to do same things with my kids. And thanks. And yeah. I was going to ask you to tie it into crank set group and how, how does that big why, you know, for listeners out there that are trying to figure out why they exist in the world, you know, yeah. how do you tie that to your crank set group adventure and your, and, and the creation of three to five club live, live, live well by doing good. How do we, right. how do we so, tie those two things together so and how me, have you married them? Yeah, so for me and many business owners, their big why will be lived out very directly through their business. Mm -hmm. And mine, and that's not the only way. I want to make sure people understand big why is much bigger than business. Sure. Yeah. Business can be one way you live it out. So for us, it's really convenient. Uh, I want to live well by doing good. And I want to impact the, the lives of business owners worldwide. And I think there ought to be a business, a, a three to five club in every town in the world, big enough to have a chamber of commerce. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. it's that impactful. Mm -hmm. So we got a long way to go. Yeah. And, yeah. and that's one way that I live well by doing good is seeing business owners figure out how to how to get their big why so that they have a real reason to have to make more money in less time. And I watch those testimonials come in on a regular basis. Yeah. And that yeah. feeds me and keeps me going. Yeah. So that's just one way in which I live out my big why. Yeah. Yeah. That's that's super interesting. Um and so. Uh, yeah, for all for all the listeners on here, I guess this is a good plug for three to five club. I got one going in Calgary here and we are growing our membership. So anybody who's local or anybody who wants to attend a, a session or two uh, on on me, you know, feel free to jump in. We got some great, great business owners in that group. And I think the ones that are in there, by and large, would say that that you know, your material check in in making money is killing your business, which is broadly what three to five club is based on those principles. And, and your journey, figuring it out, um, you know, th that's been very, very impactful for them. And they, you know, they can't live without it now. And certainly it has been for me. So um, yeah, that's the three to five club plug. Um, well, yeah. I would say for the three to five club, again, was not something I thought up in an ivory tower to make, to sell on the internet. Yeah. Uh, you know, it came out of my life. Uh, I need help. I realized that I've, I've, taken the long hard road by myself as a rugged individualist what if i had other people and this actually came from my golf game hey i, I saw my golf game change so quickly by getting a coach mm -hmm. why don't i do that in business what if mm -hmm. i did that in life yeah and so the three to five club came out of that for me because i'd seen the data on how when we do things in community with other people we learn them so much faster than even with just a single coach having a coach and community is the best yeah but yeah. the reality of it is we need a place and I, I didn't have it. The question I, I came up to with for myself is where do I go to say these three magic words? I don't know. Mm -hmm. Where in the, in the business culture do you get to do that? You can't do it with your clients. They get afraid and leave. Yeah, you get spooked. Yeah. 
your employee, your stakeholders, employees, they, they put their resumes out. You can't even do it with your wife or your. I've done it. I've done it with my employees and I've lost employees over that. Yeah. Cause, cause now they're, they're scared. It's like, really? You know, he doesn't know what's going on. My spouse says, you know, I thought he knew what he was doing. Yeah. <laughs> well, now she's not sleeping either. Yeah. Yeah. Where do you go to say these three? Well, you need to go with other people yeah. who are saying the same things. You know, yeah, yeah. I don't have this all figured out. And that's the magic of any kind of group like three to five club. It's the community aspect of being able to go there and share your bottlenecks and say, Hey, I'm having this struggle right now. What do you guys know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I think one of the, one of the main things why I was drawn to it when you asked me to, to launch one up here in Canada um, was uh, it's, this isn't, this isn't a coaching group. I'm not, I facilitate yeah. Uh, information that is largely generated by Chuck, which is largely stolen from other sources and personal experience. Uh, and, and then I layer in some of my personal experiences and we talk about it. And the thing that has that I've really enjoyed since uh, facilitating these clubs is we've got we got business owners of all stripes here. So we've got we've got some folks who are doing really well. And we've got some folks who are really in their startup phase. And um, we've got we watched a lawyer go from one person. And now he's out making his third or fourth hire in a year. And without this group, he might still just be doing it on his own, um, doing twelve dollar an hour work at his as a as a lawyer, right? And so, you know, I, I guess the point here is is everybody it's a universal set of issues here. This is a universal set of issues. We call them fundamentals. You call them fundamentals in business that most, uh, you know, they don't teach this stuff in school. They don't, you can't go to entrepreneur 101 at your university and they go, yeah, here's all the business fundamentals. They just don't, they don't teach you this stuff. You can only learn it by grinding it out or by getting some outside eyes, like in three to five club. And so that's why I really appreciate it. This is it, business is almost a great leveler. Like everybody goes through it and there's no special person there are some unicorns out there for sure who are just naturally better at it exactly. uh, but they're still fundamentals and everybody can learn the fundamentals and apply the fundamentals and that's a choice that's an intention it is it's an intention some people to your point there are some people gifted enough to figure this stuff out and really not even know what they're doing the greatest athletes make really bad coaches usually because they didn't have to figure this stuff out. It just yeah. came so it. Same thing's true. There's always going to be some people out there who have this thing figured out without figuring it out. It's one of the gifts I have is it took me a long time to figure it out. So I, I, I had to, I had to actually think about it. Yeah. And then we see the value of that in my golf game. And then we see the value of it in my business. And then uh, this woman who was functionally homeless living in the basement of, her friends uh, having had to escape an abusive situation with her two children. She's homeless and she joins the three to five club penniless and homeless. And in two and a half years, she has five people in her business and she bought her own house. And then we have the guy who in California who went from $1.2 million a year working 50 hours a week. Now he takes home probably six or $7 million a year and he works eight hours a week. And so it doesn't matter where you are in the game. When you get outside eyes, you get into these, these communities where we, we have learned through the sweat of our brow and the blood of our hearts to, to understand what the fundamentals of business are, uh, watch out. Yeah, yeah. Well, and and lots, of, lots of people in professional services, um, like in my job. I'm an, I'm, I, I was, now I'm a part-time accountant. I, I say that's on my new, that's my LinkedIn status or state or whatever it's called. I, I'm not that big on social, but um, I'm a part-time accountant now. So I, I do it occasionally. And, uh, you know, we got lawyers in our group, right? And you go, okay, what are the, what are the professions that you think the least likely to be able to build processes and build structures in their company where client service of this really complicated stuff, tax, law, whatever. Yeah. How do I get out of that? I need my brain. I went to school for a long time, yada, 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 all the things. And it's like, it's possible, even for us, yeah. even for us who are, you know, I know, I know a lot of um, folks who are retired, forced into retirement at 65, not a lot of folks, but I know I've known a couple uh, guys, I'll just say guys, because they're guys uh, who are 65 retired and either get to 73 and are still attending the office three or four days a week uh, in retirement because they can't, they're so identified with this position and they can't, they can't imagine doing anything else. And that could be, that's a double-edged sword either. Wow. That's great because you really love it. Or 
you know, you can't, you've got nothing else in your life that you're trying to live for other than doing tax returns. So I'm not sure which it is. And I'd like to ask them, but then on the flip side is you retire, you're not welcome back and you die. Right. Yeah. And, and that's a common story in our profession, right? It is, it's a subtitle in one of my books, death by golf. Death by, yeah. Because the, the research shows that people who retire at 50 are more likely to die at 60 than people who retire at 60 are to even die at 70. Right. The sooner you think you're done, the sooner you're done. Right. So we are not made this idea of retirement. Otto, Otto von Bismarck invented it in 17 in, in 1881, I think. And it's not a it's not a human condition. It's a bad thing. We were taught that we we're supposed to just have no stress and, and sip my ties and play golf all day. That's a shortcut to death. And the research shows there is just verifiable fact you want to keep alive, figure out how to continue to have reasonable but ongoing stress in your life. Mm -hmm. You're mm -hmm. constantly having to figure out, well, how do I do that? Physical, mental, emotional, spiritual, business. You know, we, we uh, have been in this house for 25 years and I make a hobby out of just blowing things up. We, we've taken a, a, what was essentially a tract home and turned it into a designer home over the last 25 years, there's nothing in here that looks like it did when we started. And we're sitting on the second floor deck that I had just finished building a, a few months ago. And we looked at each other and said, this house is perfect. We got to move. <laughs> yeah. We got to get the heck out of here because there's yeah. no stress left. Yeah. Well, and so and, we do that yeah. with our lives. You know, and I watch my neighbors and I'm 69. And, and people, when they ask me, really? I got a, my first massage in my life. Uh, last month, the guy says, you have the body of a 50 year old. I said, well, that's good. I want to be 120 when I die. But I watched my neighbors who retired when they were 55, 57, 59, and they're walking by the house slower and more stooped every day because yeah. they have, they're done. Yeah. And who yeah. said that? You know, Otto van Bismarck gave us that disease. disease. Well, and, and, I, and I think one of the, you know, just to, just to level it out with listeners here, like, I don't think that you're I don't think you're a proponent of work hard forever. I think, oh, no. you know, it's it's really just a, let's find a way of existing where we're happy all the time and keeping ourselves busy and a little bit of stress and all the things. And, and why shouldn't I have that at 42, just as much as you have it at 70? Exactly. Why? So two parts to this, the, the question in life shouldn't be, how do I get all the time, money and energy I could ever get? Because you won't, you won't get them because you don't know what to do with them. The question yeah. is, what, how can I live in a way today to be transformative in the world around me? Mm -hmm. The research shows the most fulfilled and joyful people on earth are solving other people's problems, not their yeah. own. Yeah. So how do I do, how do I get to where I can do that today? And then why would I wait until I'm 65? What if I could find a way to get the time, the money and the energy when I'm 42? Yeah. So I work to your point, I work in the crank set group business half days, three weeks of the month, three days, each of those. So it's nine days a month, half days that I have. I have scheduled appointments, half days, nine days of the month out of the 22 work days. The rest of those days, all the Mondays and Fridays and the, the rest of those and the last week of the month, I get to get up in the morning and say, how can I live a significant and transformative life today? Yeah. And sometimes it has to do with going and being with my kids. Sometimes I'm going to go read a book. Sometimes I'm going yeah. to work as a business owner. I get to choose. So yeah. thanks I for saying that because I, you know, I don't want people to get hung up on this thing that, Hey, I got to go be on a Ted talk to no. make a difference. You don't have to. No, no, no it's, it's, you, you get to decide the only thing I, I never get to say, that's a good big why all I can ask is, will that get you out of bed every morning? Yeah. Yeah. That's all I get to ask. Okay, let me let me I want to I want to pivot a little bit here. And by the way, everybody will go, yeah, well, that's really nice that you've done that, Chuck. And that sounds really hard. My my advice to you now, if you're thinking that right now is go read Making Money is Killing Your Business and come to a three to five club as my guest. It's a bit of a grind for three to five years. But I promise you that if you follow the fundamentals, you're going to it's going to work out as long as you have a good business idea and, and you stick to the fundamentals. So transitioning here a bit. 
I want to talk to you. I wanted to pick your brain for a while on this, and I, 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 I didn't prime you beforehand for this, but I know you'll be able to just freestyle it a bit. Um, so there's a there's a thing in the labor market right now, and I know I'm 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 kind of contextualizing rehumanizing um, the workforce by giving giving people the brain back. Your your latest book. Um, sorry if I got the title. Is it did I get the title exactly yeah, right? Workplace. Yeah, rehumanizing. Workplace. Yeah. Yeah, by giving everybody their brains back. And so we have an interesting um, effect, in my view, from COVID, which is, I think, I, it's a dirty word to even say the C word now, but um, I think what happened is who could work from home went and worked from home. They woke up. We just, as a huge collective society, we woke up. and But then there was this sort of weirder, stranger, darker part where a lot of people were getting government money that maybe, you know, could have gone and got a job instead. And there's there's different things at play here um, that I can't exactly explain. But what I can explain is I was at a, a CPA forum in Banff last year. And one of the one of the old practitioners came up to me and says, how are you finding people? I can't find people. You know, there's nobody out there. And I said, there's tons of people out there. They just don't want to work for you anymore. And and so and the, and he might say, we have an entitlement crisis on our hands here, folks. And so what would you, what, you know, and then, and then so I, let me chime in on that and I'll, I'll fill yeah, in some so more context in a minute. We just entered the world of colonialism um, and, and, and patrimony, patrimony and top-down hierarchy and all these other things where the people at the top of the spectrum feel entitled to certain things that the bottom should never get. And that's what business has been built on for hundreds of years, comes out of the military, comes out of uh, mercantilism, comes out of serfdom, comes out of basically uh, slavery. That's the first place we see the concept of top-down hierarchy and management is slavery. Okay. And, and so we've got this, this notion that people are entitled. Well, guess what? I love this conversation because I'll, I'll talk about this pickle factory where we had people making $8 an hour and there, and Peter Piper was packing 12 packs of, of 12, uh, jars of pickle, pickles every hour. That were 12, 12 cases every hour. That was, the, that was the maximum. That's all anybody could ever do for who knows long, 70 years. And we came along, we incentivized them and turned their brains on. And within a month, people who had never packed more than 12 cases of, of pickles on an hour were now packing 18 to 24 cases per hour and making twice as much money as they had been in the past. And the owners of the business were getting and, rich and and the owners of the business were getting rich and then they were also ticked off <laughs> those sobs they've been sandbagging us for 70 years turns out they could do 24 cases a, an hour and they never did that those yeah. sobs we're going to put them right back at eight dollars an hour in demand they do 24 so i get my response to that is okay so you own this pickle factory I'm going to take the pickle factory away from you, and I'm going to require that you double your production and double your revenue next year, and I'm not going to give you a cent more to do it. How much motivation do you have to go mm -hmm. yeah. So all I want is for everybody to be the, a, a, a capitalist. That's yeah. all I want. What yeah. if we invited everybody to the game where if you work harder and you produce more, you make more money. Every business owner I know gets excited about that, but they don't want it, the people who work for them to have the same game. Hypocrite, you can't do that. You know, And then you wonder why people don't want to work for you. Okay. Well, somebody down the street's going to pay me an extra 20 bucks or somebody down the street's yeah. going to get in a set-aside game. So, yeah. Or it's just a clearly a better place to work. So one of the yeah. interesting things that I saw, and then I'll let you go because we're coming up on time here, but it's just, I could talk to you about this stuff for hours. I really could. Uh, but I, I'm sure you've got a busy schedule uh, because it is Tuesday and it's your half day today. <laughs> So um, <laughs> uh, I was at a, I was at an AT, ATB is a local bank here. It's one of the only uh, small credit unions in Canada that actually does well, really well. And they're an Alberta bank, Alberta Treasury branches. And uh, they, they hosted a, a thing where they had some great speakers up and really, really great production. And one of the, and this is a couple of weeks ago. And one of the speakers um, was the HR director for LinkedIn and took it from 400 to 4,000 people. And he started putting up stats about the new way of work, the new way of work. And um, he on he had a chart up where he said the average 
employee stays at a company these days for 2.8 years. That's the average right now. And then he put the car companies up and on the right side of the chart was their market caps. And on the left side of the chart was their retention and they're not correlated whatsoever. And then the biggest market cap company, he had to put a question mark there for sort of comedic effect. I think everybody knows what it is right now. Yeah. And their average employee retention right now is like under a year and a half. And I think, you know, and then the punchline at the end was that it's Tesla, right? Mm -hmm. and, the, and the punchline of the whole thing was you don't need to retain people forever to make money. And so now what is that? And, and why is that happening? You got into a big discussion about people have options and they just want experiences and they want growth and they, and this is how they're getting it. Cause you can do that now. So how are you going to design your organization to live with the reality of, um, you know, a potentially lower retention cycle than you're used to. Right. Yeah. It's super interesting conversation. Well, and I think there's two things at play there uh, because I think uh, if you, if you create a culture that is better than anybody else in your industry, you are going to have the highest retention in your industry. So you mm -hmm. will solve some of that. What does culture mean now? So we have to look culture. at what people want. Good pay, education, you know, all the things. You, you, what do you think? Well, in respect, uh, uh, a piece of the pie. I want to be, I want to be. Profit share. Profit sharing, it's, but but incentivized profit sharing. I want to know that I'm getting what I'm worth. So if I made 10 pairs of shoes and the guy beside me made two pairs of shoes, I should make five times as much. It's mm -hmm. not a bonus system. It's yeah. a meaningfully involved product or a, a results-based incentive. So if you treat people well, uh, you will retain them much more. There's a, a washing machine factory in Brazil. The, the average retention or the average turnover, I think the average, what is it, uh, 30, that yeah, 35% a year of the people in a, in a factory like that will turn over. Mm -hmm. yeah. For 40 years, they've had one and a half to 2% turnover, where there's been 35 to 40% turnover for decades. Wow. How do they do it? So we're talking one twentieth of yeah. normal retention. But imagine yeah. if, if you're already profitable, imagine what that would do for your profitability. So yeah. great if you're able to do this on a year and a half retention. What if you had them for five? I guarantee your retention will go through the roof. The second piece of this is who are you, who's who's actually shuffling in and out? Who are you retaining? Mm -hmm. I guarantee you, you are retaining the people who you least want. Mm. Because the research that shows, was that that he said the exact same thing on stage, by the way. So, yeah, okay, yeah, 65 percent of the somewhere between 50 and 65 percent of the people in the workplace today have their resumes out. Yeah. And it's the people who want to improve themselves. You're going to retain with your lousy culture and your lousy the others, your lousy respect. You're going to retain all the people you don't want. So it's it's you know, it's exponential. That's that's yeah, that's really. That's really good insight. Chuck, I want to I want to thank you so much uh for for coming on here. I uh I appreciate you very much. I appreciate you immensely and uh you know, you've you, you you've had a big impact on my life and and frankly the 20 people sitting here working with me, you know, that as well. So I'm I'm really really honored to have you on and I'm I'm honored to have you as uh as a close associate and to be able to to wrap, you know, riff some things with you sometimes. So Yeah. Yeah, well, I feel the same. I, you know, I, as the recovered rugged individualist, I recognize the need for you and other people in my life who can call BS on me and and help me grow. So I appreciate it. Yeah, right on. How do we find you? And and what would we come shopping to you for? Well, uh, three to five club dot com. Three the number three t o the number five three to five yeah. club dot com or chuckblakeman.com. dot com. And we uh, uh, we have these three to five clubs that we're doing around the world where you can get in with other people and feel safe to figure out how to do business. And then I personally uh, help people with their businesses. Uh, I, I help them avoid all the mistakes I've made over the decades. So we do what we call business advisory, which is kind of a combination of coaching and consulting. Sometimes I need to ask you questions. Sometimes I need to tell you what I, what I see. And so it's a combination of those things. So we do both those. Well, Chuck Blakeman, thank you so much. And uh, I appreciate your time. Thank you, sir. Have a great rest of your day. Yeah, you too.